So I'm six years old. I'm sitting on the top bunk of the bed I share with my little sister, Talin. Hey, Tal. Contemplating life as I pretend to fall asleep, as six-year-olds are wont to do. I'm thinking about a line, specifically line 10 of the Lord's Prayer, Hyde Med. Yev mi danir in zmezi por sutun. And lead us not into temptation. So what I'm thinking about is this. It's all good and fine by me at age six to ask the big guy upstairs not to lead us into temptation. That's fine to get some help there. But what doesn't quite check out for me is that I've been taught time and time again that followers are defined by their faith. So it would follow that temptation challenges that faith. And if that faith is so strong, can't it stand up to a temptation or two, a challenge or two, here or there? In fact, wouldn't a challenge strengthen that faith? So my question was this, why avoid challenge? Why avoid challenge? My thought process hasn't evolved all that much over the past 20 years. Why avoid challenge? It's coming anyway. I, like many of you, was brought up with this thought looming overhead. 100 years ago, two men escaped twice to enable me to stand here today. Pedros and Nerses Afean, my great-grandfather and his brother, respectively, were unknowingly born into mountains of challenge. As Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire, they were born with targets on their back. When the mass deportations started, they were rounded up and they escaped through bribery and cunning back to Adapazar, where I may have been born were it not for what happened next. Sure enough, they were rounded up once more, this time onto the infamous Ottoman death trains, for which Armenians were made to purchase their own tickets, effectively buying their own demise. The train pulled into the station, and at this station, Bedros and Nerses were encountered by two German officers. Now, these German officers were in the region constructing the Berlin to Baghdad railway and simultaneously deconstructing the Armenian nation as accomplices to the Armenian genocide. But these two officers didn't play by those rules. These two officers, taking stock of the brothers' fluent German and fortuitously blue eyes, took the brothers into their employ as bookkeepers in that train station, through which hundreds of Armenians would pass every day. The brothers would comb through the trains day in and day out, saving the few that they could under their own cover within the German military. They used their second chance to try to give others the same. Now, these challenges, they were fought and faced, and they enabled me to stand here today, but they were most certainly not sought out, for that's not how this works. Challenges arise, and those who are able to stand up through a combination of good luck and hard work become survivors. They are those who tell the story of history. Now, if this resonates, it's because it should. It is, after all, in all of us, but not just as Armenians, in fact, as humans. For survival of the fittest means that someone, somewhere up the line, overcame a challenge, or 50, to survive, not to perish, and enable us to be here today. And as it turns out, all that surviving, all that challenge overcoming, it does something to people. It has an effect. And to look at this effect, the effect, of course, being survival, we should start taking a look at the cause, and in, in this case, that's overcoming challenges. And in fact, let's look at the most extreme version of that cause, the most extreme human challenge, trauma. An experience is defined as traumatic, it is unexpected, and it exceeds the individual's perceived ability to survive. It exceeds the individual's perceived ability to survive. So then what does that mean for a group, a group of people? What does it mean when a collective perception of their ability to survive is challenged by trauma? 
A fascinating study out of New York's Mount Sinai Hospital found a genetic link between the survivors of the Holocaust and their children. They found the trauma manifested in their children. Through genetic comparison between these descendants of survivors and the descendants of a group of Jewish families who had grown up outside of Europe during World War II, the study concluded that the descendants of survivors were predisposed to suffer from stress disorders. It seems that trauma echoes down the corridor of genetics in a most unwelcome fashion. But there is something to be said for choice in survival. And for that, I look to the beautiful words of Viktor Frankl, a German psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor himself, who said, everything in this life can be taken from you with the exception of one thing, your freedom to choose how you react to the situation. Your freedom to choose how you react to the situation. What he's saying there is even in the face of trauma, even in the face of the worst odds, the survivor has a choice. They have agency. I'd like to ask all of you to think about the most recent time you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. It doesn't look like it was today, but if it was, I'm very sorry for you. Let's think about your day-to-day -day activities at home, at work, in school, in life. I'd be willing to bet on this most auspicious, very bad, no good day, things didn't go quite as well as they could have. Things that you do every day didn't feel the way that they do every day. And probably people experiencing them with you didn't feel like you were quite right either. So it turns out attitude is actually everything. At the risk of sounding too much like a motivational poster, I'm here to posit that with things small, such as overcoming a very bad day, or things big, like surviving trauma, attitude has a role. And in fact, there's some real deal scientific backing to this. As it turns out, our brains are programmed for efficiency. Through repeated stimulation of both the chemical and electric variety, our brains form neural pathways that serve as speed dials of sorts. For a survivor of trauma, these speed dials are set to stress and anxiety based on repeat external stimulation. Sounds pretty bad. But turns out there's hope yet. Our brains are also smart and adaptive. We can actually influence the reformation of these neural pathways. Now, when I first learned this, that seemed a little bit too good to be true. It seemed a bit like those emails that say, learn six languages in one month. Very interesting, but also very spam. After digging a bit deeper into this school of thought, and that was a brain pun, after digging a, deep, a bit deeper into this school of thought, I found it actually has roots. First introduced by William James in 1890, neuroplasticity is the term that refers to the brain's constant reaction to external stimuli over the course of a lifetime. We can and do learn we can and do teach ourselves. And in this light, positive thinking becomes positive doing and has a real ability to affect change. So I had to ask myself at this point, does that really make sense? Because, okay, yeah, okay, it's the fact, but does it really resonate? And for me, I found it did. I thought on the old adage, you don't know what you have till it's gone. I thought about the idea that those who survive, those who overcome, those who have things that most take for advantage, when they have those things taken away from there, they are inherently more appreciative than others. Now, not a psychologist myself, wasn't quite sure if this held up to the test of this age-old adage, so I looked to the experts at the Post-Traumatic Growth Research Center, whose findings indicate that those who overcome trauma tend to experience a renewed lease on life. They sometimes even report finding opportunities in the very suffering that qualifies them as trauma survivors. Now, these results are incredible in and of themselves, but I wanted to know a little more. What does that look like on a social level? What does it look like when an entire people experience this particular brand of trauma-induced resurgence and gratitude? There's a professor at Berkeley who's often credited with expanding the conversation around gratitude beyond university psychology departments. His name's Robert Emmons. Now, Emmons teaches 
that gratitude yields high performance. Gratitude yields action over complacency. It's a type of positive feedback loop wherein gratitude yields high performance and then that yields gratitude for said high performance and so on and so forth. In one study to that effect, Emmons had participants set six goals for the next 10 weeks. He had the first group, and let's call them normies, short for normal, for today's purposes. He had them go about their regular goal-oriented activities for the next 10 weeks, set them free. He had a second group, let's call them the gratitude gang for our purposes here today. He had them keep a gratitude journal, meaning that they recorded every week five things for which they were explicitly grateful. Now, Emmons knew going into the study that those who keep gratitude journals on a daily basis report feeling more alive and excited than those who do not. But I can report feeling alive and excited from three cups of coffee, so that's not exactly excellent scientific data. But I can tell you what is. That gratitude gang reported 20% more progress towards their goals at the end of the 10 weeks than their normie peers. So let's take a step back at this point. If we're saying that performance is driven by action, which of course it is, and that action seems to be driven, seems to be stimulated by gratitude, and that gratitude is a common side effect of survival, are we not saying that survivors have some kind of inherent expertise in both gratitude and success? Now, if it were that simple, of course, I'd have much less to say on the subject. But there is one key ingredient missing, a binding agent if you will, and that's intention. The intention to engage with the bad and find the good in it, the intention to balance the heavy weight of survival with the glorious lightness of gratitude, the intention to never forget but always forgive, and in so doing, find true closure. If it's not apparent at this point, I'm no longer talking about humans and their daily goings on and your bad day and my bad day and this, that, and the other. I'm now talking about humanity. The big H, our guest of honor for today's proceedings. Specifically, I'm talking about our place in humanity. And this time when I say our, I do mean us, Armenians, those who love us or at least tolerate us. Our place in humanity. Now, what is that? I've already stated and maintained that as humans, we are all survivors, but as Armenians, we're something else. We're super survivors. Now, those who have been following 100 Lives since its launch last year will know I'm stealing that term outright, not shying away from that, but it's cool because I work for them, got it checked. For those who haven't, for a bit of context, 100 Lives is a new gratitude initiative saying thanks on behalf of the Armenian people to those who stood up for us 100 years ago to enable us to exist today. In my case, that's saying thanks to those two German officers who broke rank to enable my standing here. Out of that movement arose the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity an international humanitarian award recognizing the same selfless acts being undertaken today by heroes the world over to enable others to survive. Incidentally, the inaugural Aurora Prize ceremony is taking place next weekend here in Yerevan, and as many in this room can attest, Aurora has indeed awoken me every day and every night for the last six months or so. So then, to hear six-year-old me tell it, this notion, this feeling has resonated with me for quite some time. This idea that Armenians have something unique to contribute to the world in the way of survival-driven gratitude. Because of who we are and where we've been in the world, the fact that we're still here is nothing short of legendary. We know better than most what it means to be given a second chance and to make the most of that chance. So what does that mean for all of us? Well, to circle back, if our story teaches us anything, it's the fact that challenge cannot be avoided. It's coming. Challenge, whether it's temptation against survival or trauma against faith, it's coming for us. It's our job to endure and to survive and to carry on as positively, as progressively, and indeed as gratefully as possible. If it can't be avoided, it is then on all of us 
to live that super survivor life. It is on all of us to show those going through similar pain and suffering today that it's not only possible to survive, but it's possible to thrive. It is on all of us to recognize the courageous acts being undertaken in this very day and age that will enable a different set of people in a different lecture hall in 100 years to stand up and say our ancestors were survivors and we're grateful to their saviors. So the question I asked myself 20 years ago in the dark of my childhood bedroom still stands. And so I'm standing here asking it of all of you today. Why avoid a challenge? Thank you. <laughs>